first Global Citizen Circle event in Nashua. Woohoo! Something that we want to do more of, more of these local programs. Um, but let me tell you a little bit, for those of you, I can see some new faces here, and you may not know about Global Citizen Circle. Um, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and what we do is we bring together groups like this um, for honest conversations, for intergenerational dialogue. And um, we do that with, um, with the belief that in order to make positive, constructive change in our world, it really has to start with conversation. And so um, that is what we've been doing for almost 45 years now. Uh, we are based at Southern New Hampshire University in Manchester as of uh, a couple of years ago. And um, so we're trying to do more of these types of events. This event we're calling is part of a series, uh, Walking the Talk. And these are discussions <coughs> with change makers. And we will do more of these. We will, um, we have done several at the university, at Southern New Hampshire University. We intend to do some in the community in Manchester and in Concord and in other areas. We, we do programs regionally in Boston um, and other cities. We also do global events. We had a, a, a program that we did in South Africa uh, in 2017. So we, um, we feel that all of these, the, the local, the, the national, the global, they are all interconnected. And so um, I, I always use the term global, where we're, we're, we're discussing local issues, where, but they're global issues. And we bring global to the local and local to the global. So I welcome you all here um, for this is going to be a wonderful discussion about why we vote and why we all need to. And um, I want to take a moment to introduce very briefly, because I really do want to get to the discussion today. Um, so let me introduce to you, um, first I'll introduce Vickiana Petit-Hong. She is uh, the, the Northeast Director of March for Our Lives, and she is a first year student um, this year at um, UMass Boston. And we are so delighted to have her come up, made the trip up from Boston, and during in the mad rush hour. So we're really pleased about that and looking forward to hearing uh, her experience. And you'll see she's got a little I voted. So she'll tell you about that. Uh, next we have Mustak Arif. He is um, lives here as a new American living here in, in Nashua. And um, we're so delighted that he agreed to, to speak about his experience and from his perspective why he wants, why it's important for him to vote. Um, he is a case manager for um, building community in New Hampshire. He is the executive director of the Rohingya Society of Greater Nashua. And, um, and as I said, a new American who will be voting uh, in the presidential primaries for the first time. And last but certainly not least, Betty Tamposi, homegrown Nashua uh, native and um, longtime civic activist. Um, in local, locally active, nationally active, and globally active. Um, she was served in the New Hampshire House of Representatives, she ran for the U.S. House of Representatives, and she was appointed to be the Assistant Secretary of State of Consular Affairs um, under the George H.W. Bush administration. So as you can tell, she's got a vast experience of being involved in, in issues that are important to all of us um, and to be uh, civically engaged. And so, um, without any further ado, I'm going to let, uh, we're going to start with Betty. Betty's going to start with her, um, her story. We like to have our discussion leaders kind of make it personal. Tell us their stories. Why does she vote? Why is 
why does she think everybody should? And then we'll go from there and Benny will, will uh, take over the, the facilitating of the conversation. It's really wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm delighted, especially so because it's Nashua, mm -hmm. uh, a place that I love. And I credit growing up here with um, the work I became involved in uh, around the world, actually. But I credit Nashua for that because if you just look out this window mm -hmm. over here, you know, Nashua is known, as Sylvia and I were talking earlier, that our mayor, uh, I still call him Clark because I still feel like I'm a Nashua girl, <laughs> but um, says that we are the most culturally diverse city in the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And that gives me a lot of pride mm -hmm. because if you just look out this window over here, that was the French neighborhood where I went to uh, kindergarten, right over there on Franklin Street, that was the Polish neighborhood. That's where St. Stanislaus was. If you go over here, a little bit over on West Hollis, that was the Lithuanian area. And then if you go over to the Tree Streets, it was French Canadian and the Greek. And the judge is here, and he can tell you about the Irish. I don't know if you had a ghetto the same way that, uh, that some of our other my relatives came from the Pindus Mountains of Northern Greece, and they definitely had a ghetto over there on Ash Street. You know, but it was a ghetto in the in the in the, in the, in the best sense of the word because their identities were respected, and we were allowed to grow up with this really culturally diverse um, universe here in Nashville. Our local radio station, WSMN, which is still I think it's still on West Hollywood. Is that right? Is it? Yeah, but is it still operating? Still operating, operating. Yeah, operating. Yeah, okay. So they used to have uh, Polish-speaking programs, you know, growing up. And we'd have Polish music. <coughs> so, you know, the festival that we had here, everything, made me understand at a very young age that the world really was very rich and diverse. And <coughs> as much as New Hampshire is, uh, you know, sort of homogenized, it, it, people will, will complain from the rest of the country, Nashua was not, and I understand that we probably speak over 85 languages in this city to this day. So I, I um, I'm so happy to be here. Now we're celebrating voter registration and, and why we vote and why it's important. Now my uh, grandparents came here. My grandmother was 12 years old, and she brought her 10-year-old brother here. Um, she came, she was uh, from one of the rural villages in Greece. And they came, they were political refugees. And on um, my father's side, they came from the Pindus Mountains and my uh, great-grandmother came. Um, she uh, sadly uh, left one of her uh, teenage sons behind because he was in school and she didn't want to disrupt his education. And there was a terrible misunderstanding about that. But she was a political refugee as well. So we had a, a, a relative, an uncle, a great uncle of mine, but an uncle of my father, that was uh, eventually, he was trapped um, and couldn't come to the States um, because of war, he just couldn't get out of the war-torn place he was in. And he walked 600 miles to Bucharest and settled there with his family. But the family, in Nashua, they were farmers. We had a, a, a small dairy farm. Two of them actually, one on Broad Street, which is now a Hindu temple. Okay. <laughs> Maybe some of you attend. Okay, that's my Uncle George's place. And my uncle. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the changing landscape of New England. So you know, we still are evolving yeah. in that sense. Yeah, okay. So that was their, so their it's farm. It's space now. It's, yes. It's yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Yeah, I have many fond memories of it. But anyway, yeah. my, my uh, grandfather's farm uh, I, was where I spent 27 years raising my children on that farm. Um, it was an important uh, milestone for us to acknowledge as a family that we had relatives that were behind what became known as the Iron Curtain in Romania. It became part of a, a Russian satellite countries as they were. And to understand um, and appreciate, I didn't really appreciate it until I became an adult and traveled the world, what my grandmother went through. But can you imagine, she and her brother, 10-year-old brother, she was 12, she might have been caged to this day. 
She might be one of those children that we have in cages at the border. She might not have made it in, um, but she she did, and it's by the grace of God. So growing up, my, my relatives, um, and I'm not proud of this, but it's true, uh, I was an American girl, and when they would speak in their broken English, it would be like cringe, you know, uh, because, you know, we just wanted to fit in. <coughs> but I didn't appreciate how much they were trying so hard to fit in. Now, can you imagine? They come from the Pindus Mountains of Northern Greece. They're not Greek, but they're Arumun, which is an ethnic group. And they become UUs. <laughs> can you imagine? They become, they become members of the Unitarian Church, and they have the lamb roast up at the farm. Okay, so this is just, just an amazing, an American story. I don't think it's unique to this country, but it is really a, a, a story of, of, of assimilation, but trying very hard to keep the things that were near and dear to them. So when they would speak in their broken English, they would often call my father and say, my father was a big believer in voting because he knew the hardship that his grandmother had to go through and his father had to go through to get here. And we still had a, a, a relative in the Iron Curtain country. So he felt that, that freedom was an important thing, that the free markets were important, that his, he was able to make a living and become very prosperous. And he felt that it was this country, this government, that had allowed him and his family to prosper, that we were very fortunate to have prospered. Um, but he kept his humble roots. Um, I raised my children on the very farm that he was born on. And we tried very hard to maintain our uh, connection to the country, meaning that we oftentimes growing up, we have, New Hampshire is such a small place, that, you know, we had Barry Goldwater. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing now. I know maybe some of you are not Republicans, but I'm still a Republican. But I cross over, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but we had Barry Goldwater came to our house on Dublin Avenue. You know, can you imagine? And, and we had governors that would come. But this was not an unusual thing. This is the way life was in Nashua where presidential candidates would come to, they still do, somewhat. Not as much as it was before. But my parents became very, very active um, in the political process in New Hampshire. And, and so my relatives from the old country would call. My father would go and pick them up on the farm. And they would walk in and before they would get out of the car. And oftentimes I'd be in the car because I wanted to see them, of course. I love them. But they'd say, some, some. Who, who do we vote for? Who do we vote for? And they would walk in and they would vote and they felt very proud. So it's for that reason that my grandmother could have been in a cage. Uh, that today I feel compelled even more ever than before. But let me just say one more thing. Um, you know, if you're going to serve in the United States government, at least in the federal government, uh, at, at the level that I served at, and I was very lucky to do it, and a lot of it had to do with, with uh, who you know. I mean, you know, I, I could talk my way into the door, but uh, no, they would open the door for me, but then I would have to talk my way in so I could stay, okay? But the thing that they do when you're serving at a high level of government is the first thing that they check, and I, there was a full field FBI investigation uh, background check is what they call it, because Back in the day, they used to actually vet people that would serve for the country. I mean, today I think it's no longer that way. But we had, you know, a full field investigation with 25 interviews. But before they would even use their resources to go and check, in, in, the, in, in the best sense of the word, is um, they check to see if you voted and how many elections you voted in. And you better be, you know, I, when they told me that they were checking my voting record, I said, I voted in every municipal election. I, hope. I certainly knew I voted in all the presidential and all the state elections. But sometimes, you know, things get busy, and I was wondering to myself one night, I wonder if I missed any of the municipal elections. Okay, you haven't only helped me. Well, I passed. So I must have done it because, um, I, you know, I, that was not an issue. And, but it tells you the way that this country used to really uphold 
voting. That was when that, that was in 1988 when this was still the case. But I look now, I just got back from Austin, Texas, and I look at, I went to the LBJ Museum and Ranch. I looked at all the legislation that he passed, all the things that matter to this country, all of our social welfare, Medicaid, Medicare, education funding, um, the environment, health care. This was during this era that this country, the great society, as LBJ called it. Now, we have voter suppression. Now, we have rollback of a lot of these entitlements. And I know many of you in the audience, I've had a chance to talk to you, you know, are very engaged in this nonprofit work to take care of those on the margins. This is all getting rolled back. We have retrograde forces working. So now more than ever, in honor to your own stories, and I want to hear them, and I'm going to stop talking right now so we can turn to Vicky and some stuff. But for God's sakes, that any one of our people, any one of our family members could be in, in, in trouble and things might not work out so well. So thank you for listening and I'm going to turn it over to Mustaf. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mustaf, so I am originally from Burma. So I come as a refugee, not immigrant. So immigrant and refugee is totally different. Sometimes people don't understand. So refugee bring by the government, so you should have a lot of background check before you come in. It takes like four or five years, somehow. So I have been living in Nasha almost seven years. Uh, in my own country, I could not call myself, I am a citizen of that country. Not me, uh, let's say three, four generations. We cannot call ourselves, our, uh, we are belong to that country. So we have different situations, different topics. So the similar as refugee, so when I came in refugee, uh, let's say one and a half month, I started walking. So when we have right now a lot of people from our country, so as Muslim, they were hacked up. Most of women were hacked up. So you can see a lot of African also does. But you could not recognize Muslim or what. So they traditionally wear it. Uh, I saw one of the news is saying, oh, refugees are coming to this country, they take our benefits, they take our tax money. So I felt, oh, we coming from different country. I have been living in other country 15 years. We face the same situation. Look that we are trash, they are country, but we are are getting their country developed. Same as when I came here, after one and a half month, I started my job. So I started paying tax. So I'm not taking. So I learned that I should invoke. I also acted in uh, 1998 when uh, our uh, Democratic President Karen uh, Burmese uh, ladies Aung San Suu Kyi, that time I was 12 years old, because my grandfather was very active in politics or uh, swimming. I engaged with him, so I learned what I am here today, not from my dad. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather teach me, you should be involved in swimming. My father was government service, so we had clashed each other. He said, my government is good. My grandfather don't know, we need to do something. <laughs> so, I was part of my grandfather, so I learned from him a lot of things. So when I live in different country, I don't get any opportunity. My whole life, what should look like both? Mm -hmm. So when I came here, I have to wait for five years. So after five years, when I got citizen, I started my first board. I started from the city elected <coughs> board. That is my first board mm -hmm. in my whole life. Mm -hmm. So. Second was the state. So, as earlier told that I should be voting my first primary next coming. Mm -hmm. So I have involved a lot of year activity uh, with civic, uh, as much as I can contribute, what look like. So why I, I, I should vote? So at, at the same time, I, uh, I have two kids. One is going high school, one will start next year kindergarten. 
So I came here there for looking for their future better than me, not like me. So that what they needed, their future, they needed education. So when I, I started a school in uh, SNU, Southern New Hampshire, I know one semester how much I have to pay. Mm -hmm. So if my kid doesn't have a money, I don't have a money, they will lose their future. So that's why uh, I should care about my book. I, I should care about uh, where we're going to be selected. So uh, the, the main thing, uh, that one, I can look like, let's say, uh, sometimes people doesn't care who's going to be the board, like register. So let's say you uh, select a person, you do not know him, sometimes people selected by partisan or like face or color base is going a lot right now. So that's why we need to find out, we need to learn uh, before we vote. What should we put? So I attend several attend. Let's say somebody told that we're gonna be free all Medicare. But we just heard, we do not know how that work. Mm -hmm. So when you join, you attend that, you know where was the money. Uh, who are where they get that money. So that's why everybody should join several conversation, community, even an elected person or who are running for office. When you voting, you can take accountability to your select person. Mm -hmm. So I am not taking a long time. Uh, probably that should be uh, good for me. Mm -hmm. So I will over to Vicky. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Vicky Anna Petito. I am 18 now. Great. Um, I haven't been 18 for very long. Um, <laughs> I am a freshman at UMass Boston. And I, as you can see, I voted today in my first ever, ever um, election. It was, it was a really awesome coincidence that like, I was coming here at the same time and talking about voting with you all, um, and I'm really honored to do that. Um, so this whole experience has been like very interesting to me um, for several different reasons, other than the fact that it was my first time, one of which is I'm so, so happy that my first ever ballot was cast to a local election. I had been working with the Mayor's Youth Council from 10th grade to 12th grade. Um, you can only do it in high school, so I wish I could have stayed on. But. <laughs> um, so I, through that experience, I really got to learn so much more about the local government, how it works, how important it is, and how crucial it is to our everyday life. Um, it just showed me that local government is probably the most important thing, but somehow the most overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, and the one that most people forget to vote on, the voter turnout rate for local elections is usually very, very low. Um, so I was so ecstatic to cast my vote today um, and contribute to that race. Um, it was a crowded field. We had like 15 for the at-large position, plus there were like 10 for my district. Um, too, so a lot of research involved, um, sadness, um, but you know, it has to be done, like you were saying, you can't really walk into um, your booth and not vote um, knowledgeably, um, so you really need to do that research. Um, another reason why it was interesting to me was because I casted it right alongside my mother. Um, I, we immigrated here when I, in 2008, I was six, uh, she was 26. Um, I was with her when she took her oath for citizenship. I was here with her when she went to go take her interview for her citizenship and when she was practicing and listening to all the CDs. Like, mm -hmm. like, even though I didn't have to do that, I watched her do that. And I was with her when she casted her first vote too in America. Um, so voting has always been like something that I never questioned. And I'm so glad that I grew up in that type of environment because I know that not a lot of people do. especially those who are immigrants, those who don't really have access to voting or as much access as we should have to voting. Um, so it was really great to cast that ballot alongside her, just another part of our journey together. And um, like you were saying, it's, it's, um, it just made me think about the people who couldn't vote. Um, 
those the voter suppression that's happening all across the country, and it just verified in me very much how important my vote was. And thirdly, because I casted my vote for the first time, but I couldn't like help but laugh because I mean, like last November for the midterm election, I was a poll worker uh, at the 2018 elections, and I was helping people cast their votes, and I wasn't even old enough to vote yet. I had been involved in so many of these uh, civics uh, lifestyle or whatever, um, and been doing so much work um, around gun violence prevention, and around democracy, and around um, getting involved with your government, and here I am more than about three years later now casting my first vote. And it just, you know, first it's like, okay, cool, local government, really important. But two, voting is not the only thing. It's the first act, it's a minimum, but there's so much more. There's the researching beforehand, there's the holding them accountable afterwards. There's so much more to voting, but it's such a simple way to make an impact. It's one day, it's one waiting in line, it's maybe an hour or so, probably less, it was like two minutes for me, um, to make a difference. And that was just, it was an experience and I loved it. And to go from voting to school and learning about international relations and intro to human rights, that was, it was great. Anyways, that's <laughs> my experience. <laughs>
do their jobs mostly. I think my generation shouldn't even be the person that people are looking towards. We should just be people who are, you know, living our lives, and the people in power should be the ones we're looking to for the answers. Um, but as you can see, that's not the case. So my generation has stepped up to that challenge, and we are activating and using social media and using our voices to call out the people in power, make them um, do what they should be doing. And Musa, do you believe that we're that we are um, educating in New Hampshire? We do have a fourth grade civics uh, about New Hampshire, where it's mandatory in the schools. With your two children that you've raised, um, what's your opinion about how well we're doing in terms of civic education? That Vickiana is passionate about. I am too. Me, me as well, uh, because. We need to focus on our uh, future generation. So let's say the parents are busy, their job, you know, they are busy life when they're coming home, they don't have time to research. When the kid get knowledge, when they come back to home, probably they will tell that story. Uh, let's say when I engage any civic or any uh, city even, I bring my son and my little daughter, because that is my future. Mm -hmm. If I am not bringing them to over there, one day they don't know why they should be over there, why they should be attending. <coughs> so let's say you already mentioned it. I do not know a lot of immigrant or refugee parents know their kids are raised when they go to school. In we as parents, we think that we should send our kid to save, right? But we are worried. A lot of parents doesn't worry because they don't have that sense to understanding what going on their kid. So these uh, kids are learning environment. So right now they are look like uh, it's war zone or something. And you see the how going in in US. So sometimes I teach my kid how do they protect themselves, how do they can take uh, save their life, whatever happening at their school. Uh, I show them the news. This is, you need to look at sometimes to read news because you're going to be future then you should be teach us because you are going to school. Uh, as I, I teach when my wife also become a citizen, when the civic engagement, uh, I bring her to city hall to register because as husband, I have educated, so I have responsible to teach my wife how to register vote, so I bring them. And then when coming to vote uh, time, we say, where I should sleep, who I should do. So I say, you need to research. And, and then she told me, well, how will we research? Who is bad person, who is good person? So go and they, they have Facebook, they have uh, their social media, see what character look like, what they are uh, sending to public to the message. They are Facebook, you know, they write at what, what, what they, they try to accomplish when he become as elected member. So, and then probably she went some through. I, do, I told them, don't look like going there, look at fields, uh, oh, she's a nice guy, not that. How his character look like? So that is the main thing where we need to do more education. Education is the power. Right. So whoever, Sometimes we think that uh, we don't have time. When you get that knowledge, you make it that time right. to go to vote. Because when you're not voting, some bad guy going to be selected. Mm -hmm. Because they, they are voting. You are not voting. You say, oh, I don't care. And they are voting, so they're going to be selected whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's one thing we should care about our Vote. We should count about it. So when you vote it, you can be accountable to that elected person. Right. I love how you um, talk about educating your family, your wife, mm -hmm. and your children. And um, Toni Morrison, one of my favorite authors, mm -hmm. just passed away. And she wrote a beautiful book called God Save the Children. And it was a story of a family. Um, they, and they were so poor that the only meal that they could really afford to have together was one meal a week. And it was a Saturday breakfast where they would go all out. 
And part of, and there were, I think there were five kids in the family. But anyway, the task in this scenario, in this family, could be anyone of our families that were having dinner table conversation, whether it was breakfast, lunch, dinner. The question was, what did you learn this week that's true? And how do you know it's true? Mm -hmm. So Mustafa, when you're talking about being able to discern uh, the truth about someone's character who's uh, hoping to lead us, um, it requires some critical thinking skills. But when we teach that at the home and reinforce it in the school, I think it works the best. But can you tell me, Vikiana and Mustafa, the, the most challenging moments when you had to use your critical thinking skills when it came to assessing or evaluating uh, either a policy question or someone in a leadership role that wants to be elected. Can you tell me your most and, and why it's important to you? Yes, I can. I think it's still challenging to me right now. Um, and I don't know if I've quite answered it for myself yet. Um, but I work with Merch for Our Lives, which is a youth-led uh, nonprofit organization that deals with uh, gun violence prevention. It got started um, in 2018 um, after the Parkland shooting. Um, so I've been working in that space for the past year and a half. Um, and one of, I think, the most complex things about it is while we're promoting all of these uh, gun, sensible gun laws that need to be in place, those laws inherently and disproportionately um, affect black gun owners in the sense that it makes it a lot more harder, uh, a lot harder for um, black people to uh, obtain gun, uh, obtain guns um, because of all these new fees that we're trying to, we're trying to make it less convenient to buy a gun and therefore, you know, save lives. But at the same time, we don't want to, do, like, we don't want to leave behind black gun owners because, like, we don't. I don't know why, I don't know, I don't want to explain well, it, but, um, to the anyone else. yeah, like, if anyone's going to own a gun, they should have equal opportunity, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like something that I've been working through is how can I continue working in this space but making sure that everything that we're doing is equitable and is not disproportionately affecting the people that are most impacted by this issue. Um, a lot of um, black communities feel like they need to have these guns because they are being targeted every single day for something they cannot change, their skin color. And so, and they're li living in these communities where they're hearing gunshots every day, and it's hard to live through that and think that, oh, I don't need a gun. And it's foolish for us to think that they would think that in the first place. Um, and so it, that's one thing that I've been trying to work through um, and figure out how to, how to answer that for myself. And I don't think I'm there yet. I don't think I've answered it. If anyone has any, like, like opinions on it or like want to discuss it further after this, I'm down for that. Um, actually, I have to get that back to Austin. But maybe we can exchange <laughs> emails. Um, but yeah, <laughs> no, that's and, and, and what you're what you're talking about is is the complexity. Yeah. Uh, that in, in the nuance of it, but when you're looking at questions of equity, um, especially if it's racial or gender or in any form of an equity question. Um, that relates to the broader question of how are we going to be safe? How are we going to feel protected? <coughs> who should have guns and who shouldn't? And, and where do we draw those lines? Those are not easy questions not to easy answer. Questions. But, but to, talk, to keep talking about it is important because it educates us. I mean, you just educated me, actually. You did, and I appreciate that because it's uh, something I hadn't thought about. Actually, on that topic, let me just say that um, it, as much as Nashua had ethnicity, we did not have race questions here in Nashua. Actually, people of color, um, we had one in my neighborhood. That was it. And as a white woman growing up in this country, it's only now, actually, that I've had to think about my own race and what impact I have had on of a 
of people of color and, and what what is my has been my role and how do I discern, you know, this question of race. Um, it, and so for each of us, I think we carry that burden of, like you said, Vickiana, really working through it. We, the answers don't come as easily as one would, <laughs> one would hope, but we need to still say with the questions, for sure. Mustak, would you like to uh, join in, in, in this uh, this part of it? I, I want to add a little bit. Uh, we have, we, let's say how, when we are trying to engage more civic, people are not paying attention. I mean, they're not interested. Mm -hmm. So let's say, uh, you told that, that's why I'm not moving out of the state. Because when I try to move to other state, I, I did a lot of research. Because my first thing, when I came in in January, I, do you know the how the snow looked like here? I should move nice day. But I did research before I'm moving. Is that safe for me? Is that safe for my kids? Is that going to be better luck? But not everybody does that. So sometimes people are looking, oh, but I have more money probably. Because you are coming at a refugee lab. Nobody getting, you are a functional job. You need to start by your own job, whatever job you get. So recently, uh, I just shot. We are look like peace city, you know. We are more diverse. So someone sent to email say, "Oh, Muslim are not belong to uh, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So how you feel? Mm -hmm. So as Muslim, uh, I'm not trying to be my Muslim leader. As I'm a Muslim, oh, what look like we are leader?" Mm -hmm. He is not from Nashua, whoever. Mm -hmm. He is broadly uh, advertising this news. So let's say that news is going to be 10, 20 people reading before they don't hear that bad thing. And then he has started. Mm -hmm. They started mm -hmm. uh, reciting, oh, we need to do, we need to join with this guy, right? Mm -hmm. To do in this campaign. So that, if they can do that, why we cannot promote our civic engagement to more? Mm -hmm. So we will have a conversation with different ethnic group, different diversity communities, sit down or different leader, different uh, leadership group coming to join. Why are we not doing? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not politics. Mm -hmm. We are not saying you should put this, you should select this person. Mm -hmm. Just trying to involve, so the represent. So we, we, we should have more represented from uh, different group, different ethnicities. <coughs> So, mm -hmm. like you say, you are white. Uh, I have two several things because on my name, uh, airport, I get one time, I have to wait for one hour. Mm -hmm. Domestic, no? Wow. So that time, I think about that, if I'm going to be tra uh, transferred on another airline, mm -hmm. I'm going to be delayed. Mm -hmm. Because is this flight going to be delayed? Mm -hmm. So that's why I took a special pass of, of uh, five years or 55, so I can pre-scan it. Mm -hmm. So I pay a dollar, so not make me late. Because sometimes I travel a lot in uh, uh, the Wednesday, mm -hmm. so they look at my name. Mm -hmm. But look like, uh, I, I don't think, I, some people do not understand, but I think, mm -hmm. I feel, I am getting some different treatment than other people. A job or whatever, when you apply. So, so that should be we have. Because I'm a citizen, I'm contributing in this country. You just are thinking about the immigrant or refugee. <coughs> so when a refugee and immigrant, a lot of contributing, the local people, probably some people doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I'm a, the, the homeowner, I'm paying the entire city mm -hmm. monthly for my, like eight, nine hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. right? right? Before when I came in, nobody, some people doesn't accept me as a refugee coming to Nigeria or the Right. But it's totally we are contributing, so that we, they should be calm us. Uh, they, they should be heard our voice. Mm -hmm. it, well, a absolutely. In fact, I think when my um, grandparents came here, um, we were people of color because we came from the Mediterranean. So I think that we, we had, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually researching that part of it, but I'm told that we, we, we did not declare ourselves, my family did not declare themselves as white. Okay, so my prayer for you and your family, 
all of us, is that you will not have to feel like you have to justify your existence here. You have every right to be here. Every right to be here. And uh, that you won't have to feel like um, that, that to explain to any of us that you're a taxpayer. That, that, you know, that my grandfather, I'm sure, felt that way. That he had to justify his existence. Because, you know, there's this culture of feeling less than. But Vikiana, how, is the, how are your generation going to save us from <laughs> this kind of, of, of are, are, you, are, are, your peers, are your peers more accepting of, of, of gender and race and, and uh, class issues? Oh, I definitely think we are. Um, and that's not to say that it's gone. The, these kind of things, they're, they're taught and, you know, all of, like you see us all across the spectrum just like any other generation, um, but I definitely think that like, we are way better. Um, <laughs> um, um, but I do think like, we are at a, we just have a lot more access to information yeah. and to yeah. other people. Yeah. Um, and that's what really breaks these kind of um, barriers, just really getting to know other people and hearing about their experiences, having conversations like these. Mm -hmm. And we're able to have that way easier than any yeah. other generation. And that's, I think, really been able to help us break those barriers uh, among ethnic groups and, and racial lines and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that my generation will be making some very significant change. We have already made some very significant changes and impacted um, this country greatly um, already, um, and I expect us to continue to do so. Well, you are a great role model for your generation. So now, now is the time for all of us to share, and we encourage you that if you've heard something, you want to share why it is that you vote, why it matters to you, um, anything about your family story, anything you've heard here. What we have heard here tonight, though, is a lot about um, grounding ourselves as persons together in a community with diversity where no one has to feel judged or excluded or having to justify anything, that we're all here together. So I'm going to work opening it up. Hi, I'm Rena. Um, I'm a sophomore at Southern Hampshire University, um, and I am honored to be a part of this great organization and work with CEO. Um, but I just wanted to say that I do agree with Vicky about um, our generation and how important it is for us to step up and vote. And I know a lot of my friends and peers, I've heard them saying that it's, why should we vote? It's not that important. And that really just irritates me because we are the future and it's time for us to step up and be able to say what we believe in, what we want for our future to look like. So. I'm the presiding minister of the Tree of Life Interfaith Temple in Milford, New Hampshire. And I'd like to respond to uh, some of the comments that you made because we had a really important and exciting event happen this past weekend. We invited people from all different faith traditions to come and sit together and talk about how we can work together to overcome gun violence and to help promote peace in our communities. We had Hindus, we had Muslims, we had Christians, Catholic and Protestant, a whole host of interfaith ministers, and everyone, it was, it, it gives me chills just thinking about it, everyone going around the room was saying, just get to know me, just come and talk to me, just come and sit with me. And so we started, we started last weekend, and we're going to keep the ball rolling and keep going and keep offering opportunities to bring people of all different ethnic traditions, religious traditions, to sit together, to, to see one another, to hear one another. And that's how we find our common humanity. That's how we go, that's my brother, that's my sister. And that's why I vote. That's what America means to me. So, absolutely. Don't be uh, bashful in coming up to Stephanie and getting him.
connected to her community in their discussions because they're very welcoming. I've been doing that for on and off over 20 years, so it's well worth the time to go out to where Stephanie and her her um, her programs are. So, Sylvia. Hi. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone at the Global Citizens Center for coming to Nashville because we welcome you and we're glad you're here. 